hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas. And we post a video every week on a Friday. So do hit subscribe if you want to know what our continuing adventure might be. And don't forget that we have our Monday shorts. So if you've got a question you'd like to ask me, some burning horticultural conundrum, Put it in the comments below and we'll get round to answering it in our Monday shorts. We will indeed. But Stephen, I'm feeling mountainous air. I'm hearing the wind whistling between the pine needles. Where are we? All right. Well, we're in the other major horticulturally important area of southern Victoria. Yep. Uh, I'm from Mount Macedon. We're now in the Dandenong Ranges in a wonderful property here uh, that has quite an interesting background and history. Aha. Uh -huh. And what is it? <laughs> well, it was originally bought by Arthur Streeton. Ah. And he's probably one of Australia's most famous uh, painters in his time. He was a combatant of Alice Rowan's, who is somebody important uh, at Mount Macedon. So we're in the opposition's camp mm. up here in the Dandenongs. And so um, uh, he was here till about 1945 uh, when he passed away. And the property has been handed down through the family members over that period and still belongs in the Streeton family. So just to contextualise Arthur Streeton for our non-Australian viewers, he was born in the 1860s, died in 1943, and was perhaps the first international renowned Australian artist. Yeah. And However, yes. you mentioned Ellis Rowan, Arthur Streeton painted oil landscapes and sometimes portraits and mm. um, vistas of people in the landscape. Ellis Rowan was a woman and a botanic artist, which in those days was considered it women's was, work and hobbyists. Yeah, so, not fine art, no. apparently. And that's what Streeton and Tom Roberts and all of that group of the Heidelberg School, as they were called, mm. were very down on Alice Rowan because she was a lady who painted flowers. Mm. Funnily enough, Streeton finished his career painting bunches of roses. But anyhow, that's another thing. And Alice Rowan won gold prizes over Arthur Streeton yeah. in Australian art competitions. But anyway, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was that's a century ago. That's all in the past. So uh, let's, let's we, move on. We are now in, I was going to say the wreckage, but it's not because it's mm. like the phoenix, which has arisen of his original garden. Yes. And uh, our good friend, Craig Wilson, has been managing this garden for many, many years. Mm. And so it is, in fact, moving moving in a forward direction, which is lovely to see. Absolutely. Now, Craig Wilson, you might be familiar with, he is the owner and operator of Gentiana Nursery, and we've made many a video there. Our Hosta epic was filmed with Craig. Yes. Our Bonsai epic, which I'm still recovering from, was made with Craig. We shot a beautiful film about New Zealand foliage plants yes. in his personal garden. So we'll link all those below so you can find out more about Craig. But I think without any further ado, we should go and find him yeah. and get him to give us some context of this garden. What a good idea. He's been here a long time. He knows how it all works. Well, I have to say, I'm really excited to be here. So thank you to the Streeton family for allowing us access. It's a private garden, so we feel very privileged to come and have a wander through. And without any further ado, we should go and wander through. Let's do exactly <laughs> okay. that. Well, hello again, Craig. You yes. seem eerily familiar. That's yes, right. yes. <laughs> yes, we've spent a fair bit of time in your nursery, but this yeah. is the first time we've taken you out of it. Yes. 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 So where are we? Tell We're at Long thing. Acres, which was the garden of Sir Arthur Streeton, yeah. the landscape artist. Yeah. He is, in fact, the only Australian landscape artist exhibited in the British Museum. Oh. Yeah. So an important character an important in our... important character yeah. in our art world, yeah. I think, yeah. Yes. Um, he planted this garden in the 1920s. All okay. oh, right, yeah. yes. Uh, mostly with American natives. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that is, is, is his wife was Canadian. Ah. He wanted to lure her up here. <laughs> but he planted American things, not Canadian. Well, it's sort of the same thing, <laughs> really, at least florally. I've lured yeah. the wrong person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not exclusively. Yeah. But yeah. And so when it first started, it was substantially bigger than this, though, wasn't it, Craig? It was originally six acres, yep. and then it became 12. All right. And then yeah. it's gone back to six again. All right. So the original form of the garden is back to what it was. That's right. Fact. Yeah. 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 And what's been its history? We've been to a few historic gardens which have had ups and downs. So what's been the arc of this in the last century? 
So it was maintained when Streeton was in control of it, and then he left it to his son Oliver, mm -hmm. who did nothing but plant rhododendron, mm -hmm. and he bought rhododendrons from the UK in Wardian cases. Oh, goodness me. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Back before quarantine. That's right, yep. and planted them all over the garden. And he was in league with Arnold Teese and, you know, quite oh, a few yes. of those people. Yes, all those rhododendron collectors of the Dandenong Ranges. That's right, yes. indeed, yeah. Perfect environment for yeah. them. And then when he died, it went to his wife, and... It, it just became more and more dilapidated. Mm. So she wasn't as engaged with it in her era? No, well, neither was he, really. Yeah. He just planted rhododendron, and that's all. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So a specialist. Yeah. Oh, dear. And then when did you come into the orbit of the garden? So Roger, who was the grandson of Arthur, bought the property in 1999 mm -hmm. from his mother, mm -hmm. and then he employed me in 2000. Ah, so you've been here for well over 20 years. That's right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So what were the challenges you were faced when you came up the drive for the first time 20 years ago and then today? Well, when I first started, it was just at the beginning of the millennium drought. Oh, yes. Well, we all remember Everything that. Everything we planted was a disaster. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine. Yeah, so lots of things were pulled out and burnt and replanted. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't really understand, or I didn't, that it was a full-on drought going on. Yes, well, it went on forever, or at least it seemed like it as a commercial nurseryman. Mean, I found that, you know, yet another year went by and yet another. That's and, right. yeah, it seemed like it was never going to finish. Never going to finish, yeah. yeah. So that was the initial struggle. Mm -hmm. And then it was just getting plants to grow in an established garden and filling it in yeah. because it was basically just trees. Right. And had it been maintained at all? Was it overgrown? What? Oh, no, it was a total mess. Yeah. Holly, ivy, sycamore. All of them all nasty the ones. All <laughs> of Hill's weeds. Yeah. yeah. For our American viewers and, and British viewers, none of those things are native to our neck of the woods. No. But in this particular climate, they have gone gangbusters. They love yeah. it. And they yep. keep coming in from outside too, so it's a constant job. It's not yeah. something you can clean up and get away with and then move on to something else. That's right, particularly yeah. the sycamores. And so we're going to wander through and look at some of the things that you've achieved. So what, moving forward, what would you like to see happen with the garden from now on? I would like to see it get a, have a future. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the, the biggest issue. How does that happen? It depends on the uh, inheritance and That's who ends right. up who being in charge and who wants to look after it, I guess. And do they have the money to maintain? I mean, yeah. it's an expensive place to look after. Yeah. Well, you know, these just employing in a gardener. Say, you're not cheap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, nor should you be. Yeah. Um, but something that has dawned on us as we had a quick look around earlier and something I want to engage with whilst we're at it is one of your big issues within the garden would seem to be, of all things, deer. The deer turned up. 12, 15 years ago, yeah. and their numbers have just built ever since, and I think this is their paddock. Oh, right. They're here all night, every night. And once again, for our North American European viewers, deer are not endemic to yeah. our continent. They were introduced in the 19th century, and they're not common in many places, but, but where some they are, places. they are... Very common. Well, yeah, it's taken sense. them a hundred years and they've reached the point now where their population's exploding. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes, which they is double a, every year. And it's a serious issue for gardeners. So how do you, well, you probably don't manage the deer particularly well, but how do you garden around them? Anything which is capable of growing above them, yeah. you can fence until such stage it does that. Yeah. And hope that when you take the guard off, they don't eat the bark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, you just plant things they don't eat, yeah. which uh, shrinks the, the, the amount of plants you can grow down to a bare minimum. Yeah. And how do you know in our environment what they will and won't eat? You put a pot out and see what happens to it. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah. Well, you, it makes sense, though, because you're putting out a, uh, a plant there to see. So you, you, you're putting out a, uh, perhaps a um, death sentence on one plant. Mm. But if you planted up a whole bed with them, uh, before you realise what was going on, then you lose a whole pile. So, And then they discover things, like the cyclamen hydrofolium, which this garden was full of. Yeah. And they coexisted for many years. Ah. And then suddenly they found them, and that was the end. Yeah, so it's not even a, I've now discovered a plant they won't touch necessarily, because it could, in fact, be something they come back to right. at some point. Yep. Bizarre. I mean, I guess, too, for our... North American European viewers, this is a very common gardening problem in parts of the world. But I guess to contextualise it in Australia too, deer are only really a problem in the cooler temperate parts yeah. of the country in the south. And really in, in Victoria, it's the more 
elevated mountainous region. Yeah, so Mount yeah. Macedon, where, yeah, where are, I am, there, there are deer problems. Yeah. Are. But on the plains, you do not find deer. Because no. there's no forest. Yeah, no. yeah, they need the forest. Yeah. Yeah. So the kangaroos have got the plains all to themselves. There you go. Yes. And we have two species here. We have fallow deer, mm -hmm. which are English park deer. Yep. And we have samba from India, which are big. Yes, they're big beasties. They're like a, the size of a cow. I yeah. wonder where they came from. From a zoo, perhaps. They would have been introduced by the Acclimatisation Society. Yeah. Yes. Now, that, viewers, is a fascinating but deeply cancelled <laughs> yes. organisation throughout sort of the British colonies, I suppose, whereby settlers wanted to either exoticise or remember their homeland or find new and wonderful yeah. sources of food and introduce and it seemed, all manner of animals yeah. and, and birds. And it seemed logical back in the time, you know, yeah. rabbits, foxes. I mean, foxes are one that really get me because they were only released so that people could rush around on horseback going tally-ho. Yeah. Uh, there was no real other reason for importing foxes into Australia. It wasn't to control mm -hmm. rabbits? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, think, I think the foxes Hunting. and the rabbits came in at about the same time yeah. and I don't think they thought that side of it through. Yeah. Um, and rabbits I sort of get because they are a reasonably easy to catch food animal so I could get that but some of the exotica that they released into Australia much of which didn't take off mm. but some of it was bizarre mm. the minor birds in Melbourne introduced mm. from India which have but that's for cattle ticks oh really yeah. is that why they were introduced mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, well, so there you go. So there might have been a reason, but anyhow. There's a whole subtext, the Climatisation Society. I read a fantastic book about them. They were insane. Yeah. The book is called yes. They Dined on Eland because there was this notion that deer should be introduced to certain colonies to produce food. And meat. for a hunting source. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now we've covered colonialism introduced species and the future. Anything else we need to know about this garden? Oh, the house is interesting. Mm. The house, if you see any of the literature on Long Acres, it's described as an arts and crafts building. Yeah. Mm. But according to Roger, he built it in the a street and built it in the style of an American farmhouse. It sort of got that look about Once it. Once again for Nora, for his yeah. wife. Very he was sweet. obviously passionately in love with his wife, That's which is right. very sweet. Yeah, <laughs> but she wouldn't move from Turak. <laughs> so none of it worked. None of it worked. Uh, uh, Non-Victorian view, Turak is the poshest, most expensive suburb in Melbourne. Yeah, so there you go. And yeah. I can understand her wanting to stay Absolutely. in Turak. I'm not yeah. leaving. So. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we should go and have a look and yeah. see the wonderful work you've done over the last 20 mm -hmm. years, Ray. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you for introducing us to the garden. Yeah, yeah thanks for your it's time. An, yeah, it's an interesting property. It, it could have a lot more done to it. Well, even on our ramblings, we've come across this amazing Woolamai pine. Yes, which, which is huge. Yeah, one of the nicest I've seen. And it's probably from one of the very early sales of Woolamai pines when they were first released onto the market. Mm. With huge fanfare, I remember there were actually selected plants from s selected parent plants in the wild, and they had provenances, uh, and you paid tens of thousands of dollars for one. I'm not sure that this one fits that category, but it's certainly a well-grown specimen and it must be getting up to eight to 10 meters tall. So it's quite a, an advanced plant. And it's got cones? It's, yes, it's got cones. So it's had both male and female cones. So there might be some viable seed if I can get up high enough. And the thing that I'm really curious about is that it seems to be sort of bushing out from the base. Is that yep. typical? Yeah, it is one of those things. The, um, the Woolamai pine, like quite a number of conifers in this Oracaceae group, tend to have um, uh, epicormal shoots that will come out from near the base. Yeah. Um, and so you'll often end up with multiple trunk specimens. So it does it quite often. So it's normal-ish. And we're saying Woolamai pine, but its botanic name is? Woolemia nobilis. Yes. So uh, Named after Mr. Noble. Yeah, which I, I still love. I think it's a wonderful play on words because mm. nobilis means noble. And so therefore, so does Noble. And, and yes, so does Noble. And so it's sort of a double entendre in plant names, which I think is clever. But in a lot of our garden stories, you've made the point about a garden that's about collecting uh, needs to maintain its collecting mojo. Yeah. And so having a Woolamai is very natural yeah, in this well, garden. Of course it is. It's sort of the done thing to have something in a collector's garden that has become newly discovered. So the Woolamai pine certainly fits that. Uh, and this one is a wonderful specimen. And I think we should go in and have a look at the bark too, because this one's starting to develop mature bark on it, which is oh. quite characteristic of a Woolamai. It has a, a bark that's unlike any other tree I've ever seen. Okay, well, we'll, we'll We'll press pause and try and get a little closer. Yes. Well, this is exciting for me because it's the first wool of my pine I've 
met that in fact is starting to develop its mature bark. And I knew that the bark was quite unique and it's got this sort of bubbly bark. Somebody once said it looks like chocolate crackles. So it's got that, this sort of weird uh, lumpiness to the bark and apparently that becomes even more so as the tree gets older and older. So this is my first encounter with the bark of a maturing Woolamai pine. Of course the other thing you've got to remember is this one's doing particularly well because it's in an environment which suits it to the you know, absolutely to the nth degree. The Woolamai pines in the natural habitat grow down in deep gorges uh, in the Woolamai National Park just outside of uh, Sydney and so they're in damp, cool, climates, the sun doesn't shine in on them particularly, certainly not down to the roots. And in the Dandenong Ranges and also at Mount Macedon, the conditions are so similar. The soil's acidic, uh, there's adequate moisture basically year round, uh, and you've got the cool evenings even if you have a hot day. And so it probably feels like it's at home. Well, Stephen, this little bower caught our eye. What are these incredible trees with this amazing bark? Well, they're very old Robinias, uh, and they come from North America. And as we both have been taught, Mr. Streeton was trying to uh, endear himself to his North American wife. His Canadian wife yes. by planting American species. Yeah, so. yeah. now Robinia is one of those plants that uh, you can have a, a love-hate relationship with. Mm. They tend to sucker, mm. and there's actually a copse of them here, and it may well have started off as one tree, possibly this big one we're standing next to, mm. and others have suckered around the garden. They are not for the small garden, and yet they're sold in vast quantities by the nursery industry, mm. particularly in the gold-leafed version called Frisia. Mm. And they sucker dramatically in the garden, particularly if you decide you don't like them anymore and you cut the tree down, then the whole root system will erupt with suckers. So I would think twice before planting a Robinia, and when you can see how big these ones are, admittedly they date back quite a ways, mm. uh, they're probably not a tree for an average garden. That being said, they look to me like the trees of Chinese brushstroke drawings. They're really quite beautiful. Oh, I've, gorgeous. I've seen lots of them around, but I've never seen any that look quite like this. Yeah, I've seen a few of them in Europe, in some of the older gardens in Europe, because they've become a weed and feral all through France and, and the damper areas of Europe. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think the very first of the Robinias was is still in France somewhere in, I think in the Jardin de Plantes or nearby. Uh, the very first one that was ever planted in Europe and it's this scruffy poor old thing that's only just hanging on to existence. And they're now through the forests all over Europe and they look like they're a native tree. Ha, so they are deciduous and they bloom. They have beautiful sort of wisteria-like yeah, flowers. Yeah, white wisteria-like flowers mm. in the spring. Uh, so they can be quite a pretty and elegant tree, but they are certainly not a tree for gardens unless you're on acreage. Yes, but these particular ones just have incredible character, unlike any I've seen before. Yeah, well, you haven't seen them this old before, probably. True, yes. true. All right, let's go on to the next interesting thing in this garden. Yes. No, I just loved these leaves. Oh my goodness, I've just felt the furry underside. <laughs> yes. So what is this? All right, well, we're looking at some grandy series rhododendrons. There are a group of rhododendrons that come from the Himalayas, mm -hmm. uh, and they're sort of primeval looking rhododendrons with their huge locust-like leaves. Yes. Uh, and they have a furry ingermentum under the leaf. In the case of this one, it's a lovely coppery brown color, mm. uh, which is absolutely beautiful. Now these, groups of rhododendrons, you can often tell which one's which by the ingermentum. They're all early flowering. They tend to flower in very late winter, early spring. Uh, and they generally have flowers in cream through lemon, and then they're sort of soft to dusty pinks. But in Australia where they're not grown very much, in fact, sadly, they're almost impossible to buy now. A lot of them have been seedling raised over the years. So they're seed that's been collected in cultivation. So therefore you've got a whole batch of different species together. And so it's very hard to be absolutely positive as, you know, whether you're looking at Grandy or Sino Grandy or Hodgen's Eye or Maccabeanum, all of that group, because they're so hybridized here and you rarely see them for sale for other reasons. They take years to flower. Mm. So impatient gardeners aren't up for these. Mm. They're hard to propagate. And if you want to produce one that's a known species, you've probably got to graft it to make sure you're getting the right plant. And they can grow immense. Um, so you can end up with a rhododendron that's 30 feet tall or more, so 10 meters or more tall. So they perhaps don't lend themselves to the smaller garden. So I guess maybe this is part of that rhododendron planting that um, Craig was talking about. Now, 
if they're a Himalayan sort of altitude yeah. plant, then I guess too, they're not ideally suited to many parts of Southern Australia. Well, that's the other issue, of course. There's only areas like here in the Dandenong, Mount, 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 Mount Macedon, perhaps up in Victoria's Northeast, there's some areas up there they'd grow quite well. Mm. But there's a very limited uh, um, area that you can grow them in. Mm. So because they're difficult to propagate, they grow really big, they don't flower for donkey's years. Uh, tick, 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 tick. Yeah, tick. and they grow enormously big potentially. Obviously, there's a limited market for them. So uh, I've struggled to get stock to sell for the last 10 or 15 years. They've virtually been unavailable, unfortunately. And the flowers, I mean, they're, they're rhododendron-like, but they're just sort of different in form. They're much bigger and more trumpet-like. They're biggish heads. Yes. Uh, and they're very thick textured flowers. They're almost waxy uh, mm. in the flowers. And I guess, yeah, they're big flowers. They, they, they present themselves well against the big foliage. So mm. everything is large with regards to grandy rhododendrons. <laughs> but you were just mentioning this one, which looks yes. more like a, a laurel. Yes. But the underside is completely different. Yeah, this one has a more sort of silvery undersurface on the leaves. So that's one of the defining characteristics of the different species. But because so many of ours are probably of hybrid origin, and I wouldn't like to try and name any of them specifically. Mm. They're very striking foliage plants though too. Oh, fabulous foliage plants. But I do remember a lady coming into my nursery once when I had a big batch of them and said, I thought you stocked rare plants. Look at all those locust trees. <laughs> I was offended beyond belief. I'm sure belief. you were. Yeah. That's, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't cope with that. That's that was, a trigger for Mr. Oh, Ryan, yes, it selling certainly common was. things. Yes, exactly. All right, on to the next. Let's go. So Stephen, <laughs> here yes. we are in this, what are we calling it? A, uh, a glade? Uh, I'd almost think it verges on a forest of yes. uh, Douglas firs. How extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it in Australia. Yes, well, it is a bit a, a sort of odd thing to have done. Yeah. Uh, but Craig tells me that uh, Arthur Streeton planted these back in the 1920s or thereabouts. Yeah with the whole idea of having ship masts that he could then sell on once they got big enough. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, ironically, they are very tall and straight. Yes. And over a century later, they're probably harvestable size. What a pity yes. the market in wooden ship masks has crashed. Yeah, well, exactly. So I think Arthur was showing off his artistic temperament and not his practical one yes. when he planted these. Of course, these have would have also engaged with his Canadian wife as True. another planting of North American trees. And it still didn't get her up here. <laughs> <laughs> Who would leave Turak? Yes, exactly. For the cold environs of, of Mount Dandenong. But I think the other thing to just observe too are the beautiful tree ferns. Yeah. So Craig added this, and he said that when he first came onto the property 20 years ago, that this was just an overgrown thicket with ivy up the trees. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't get in. Sycamores, hollies, the whole dreadful sort of mess. So he's thinned it out and planted these tree ferns, which really ground it as a sort of, as a design moment, really. You've got what these does? very tall, straight trunks, and then the juxtaposition of that beautiful, yeah. soft, furry. And it gives you something sort of more at eye level and below. Yes. So it's working seriously well. So there you go. Every garden should have a forest of Douglas firs, and apparently. And chop, chop them down and use them as masks. Yes. <laughs> On to the next. All right. All right, coming into this garden today, it suddenly dawned on me that autumn is really upon us. And uh, it's been done by these beautiful colchicums being in flower. So they've got lots of common names, sometimes Naked Lady, sometimes Meadow Saffron, sometimes Autumn Crocus. Uh, the last two names probably are misnomers, but anyhow, Colchicum will do for me. And they come up at this time of the year, just as the cooler weather's starting to set in, and their leaves come up later in the winter after the flowers die down. So you never have the leaves and flowers together. And they do really make a spectacular show, albeit a fairly short one. You really only get a few weeks out of colchicums. The flowers will then collapse to the ground and that's it for the year. But I don't mind, they're so beautiful that I'm happy to live with that. And also in this rock garden is another plant that I have a great soft spot for. And it's one of the Nareens or Nareenies, depending on what school you went to. And this one is sold in Australia as Fothergilla Major. 
although I think it's probably a form of Noreen um, sarniensis. Uh, and it's a lovely bright orangey red flowered one with little gold dust speckles on the petals if you get the sun on them. And they do in fact call it the gold dust Noreen. And they're of course South African, uh, the Colchicums are Mediterranean, but they both come from similar climatic zones and do beautifully together in the rock garden. Of course, if you're growing any of these summer dormant uh, autumn flowering bulbs, the main thing is to remember that they don't like a lot of summer irrigation. They need to have a nice dry spell in the garden. Uh, Noreens will in fact stop flowering if they get too much moisture right through the summer months. So somewhere where they can dry out. So somewhere with good drainage, preferably a bit of raised ground. Make sure that your Noreens have their bulbs sitting slightly uh, proud of the ground so that they get a, a good baking in the summer and don't fiddle with them too often. Leave them in situ to build up into decent sized clumps because they seem to flower better if they're a little bit sort of congested in the clump. Ah, Stephen, I think this is one of my favorite spots in the garden. It is so beautiful. Yes, well, this is an apple arch uh, or tunnel that Craig has actually installed. So this is one of the newer parts of the garden. Uh, Arthur Street and wouldn't have ever seen this. No. And he's done a remarkable job. It's got this fabulous canopy of, I'm assuming a normal commercial apple. It's not a crab apple or anything like that. Yeah. That runs all the way along to a really nice urn surrounded by ginger, uh, one of the orange flowered gingers. Uh, I assume Hedicium cicinium. Uh, making a lovely feature at the end. It's beautiful. Imagine this in spring when you're in a, a tunnel of blossom and it's just gently wafting down. It is so beautiful and what a clever idea. Yes, I think it works really well within the garden. Yeah. Although it's a newer feature, it nods to the garden's past. It's not something that's jarring. Mm. Uh, and I guess the average person coming in wouldn't even realize it's not a an original part of the garden. But yeah, I think it turns an area that probably would have been a bit of a blind area mm. uh, into a feature. It's absolutely beautiful. And along either side is a row of hellebores. Which must look lovely in the late winter when they're in bloom. And on that side, a row of azaleas. And on this side, are they? Well, there's some peonies tree there. Tree peonies, yeah. Yes, there's some tree peonies wow. along there. And there's two perennial borders going in either direction. Which, which we're gonna look at. Yeah, and which is important too, because if you plant or plonk an arch or a tunnel or something into a garden, there is no point in doing it if you can walk around it. This is also your theory of pools. Yes, exactly. Ponds. So, yeah, ponds and things. If you, uh, why put a bridge across a pond if you can walk right round it? And it's the same with arches and things. I've so often seen uh, rose arches and things plonked in the middle of a lawn where you can walk all the way around it and it actually makes no sense whatsoever. Mm. Whereas this is the only passage through to those beautiful gingers. Yep. Let's just go and have a quick look at the gingers. Good. Well, here I am standing amongst the ginger lilies and I do love them. And they're making a fantastic sight line from one end of the apple walk to the other. And this particular one, which I'm fairly convinced is Cicinia, is a very useful one in cooler climates because many of them flower quite late, which sounds like a good idea, except that I find many of them flower just as the frosts are about to come in. So it knocks them to the ground and some years they don't even get to flower. But this one flowers in that late summer, early autumn before the cool weather sets in. And so I get a good show off this particular species in my own garden every year. And then lastly, Stephen, this perennial border caught my eye. Now, we've stopped at many a perennial border in we our time, but this have. one, I don't know, really struck me as different. And I think the thing for me is the row of miscanthus along the back. Yes, the miscanthus is doing a great job. It's a cultivar called flamingo, mm. obviously enough, because it has that fabulous sort of dark coppery pink uh, plumes on it. And it's picking up the colours that have been used in this border so well. So there's sort of other burgundy foliage plants like the Persicaria red dragon, which is looking quite good in the middle. The dahlias are often dark leafed ones. So there's one over there with orange flowers and dark foliage. Not sure about the cultivars of the different dahlias. And there's this rather strange and interesting one on the front here that has mm. flowers that are pom pom -y looking. And some of them are straight red. Some of them are marbled. Some of them are almost half and half. So it's a very unstable dahlia as far as its color's concerned, but it works really well in this border. And I think for some reason, it's this red, this sort of pom-pom multi-red thing that just 
brings it all together for yeah, me. It's, it's sort a of pops. Real, yeah, it's a beautiful border. And when we were visiting the Dreamthorpe um, perennial border yes. there, you did talk about that height, the issue of having height at the back of yep. a perennial border and how important it was. And there, I think they had, was it just a row of roses? Yeah, they, and they had hedges as well yes. along one of the perennial borders. Yeah. Here, the Miscanthus is actually doing that job quite well, giving yeah. a good background to the border. Uh, albeit the border, when it dies down. I was about to say, yeah. however, yeah. a hedge is there forever. Miscanthus is not. No, exactly. So at some point or another, this whole border will get cut down, yeah. including the Miscanthuses, and then it will have to start off again next spring. Mm. Maybe not a bad thing. I mean, it makes the border dynamic in a sense. But yes, it's it's a classical perennial border with almost everything in it is herbaceous perennial. Mm. Uh, so the border will have a particular downtime in the winter. Yeah, it will indeed. I do love the strong colours, the orange, the red. Yep. There's golden leaf conifer over there, the blue of the salvia, the miscanthus. Really strong colours. It's beautiful. Yep. And you know, strong colours in our often harsh light here, they yeah. pop. And so you really get to appreciate them. Whereas if we'd gone down the subtle route and had all pale pastels and soft pinks and things, it's not going to stand out in the same way. No, not at all. All right, Matthew, this is the final tree I wanted to engage with that's in the garden here. And it's yet another North American species of tree that I'm sure Arthur Street and planted to lure that wife of his up out of the Turak. <laughs> yes, up to the Dandenong Ranges. And it's not a tree we see in Australia very often. And in fact, this specimen is apparently on our national tree register. Mm. And it's certainly a good sized specimen. So it's Tilia Americana, uh, what's known in America as basswood. Of course, the European ones are generally known as limes or lindens. Mm. Um, so this has leaves that would put the average European linden to shame. They are massive. It's huge. And it's a really handsome looking tree. Yeah. And it's probably a shame that we don't actually see this planted in Australia more often because I think it's a really, really handsome tree. But conditions wise, could it take the warmer weather of the plains or does it need to be in a cooler mountain well, climate the, like this? The European ones can be grown around Melbourne. Mm. Uh, there's some lovely specimens of Tilia europea and cordata in the Melbourne Botanical gardens but because this tree hasn't been around to show off its potential in this country particularly well I'm guessing a bit I'd say it probably does better in the cooler climate so mm. it's probably going to be better here in the Dandenongs or up at Masson Ranges or wherever mm. um, but it would be a shame if somebody didn't try <laughs> all you need is the space it's yeah. a handsome sized tree yeah, mind it you mm. it's a hundred and Pretty, well, well, yeah. it's, it's over 100, 100 years old. It's under five years, 1920, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Whatever. It's an old tree, but it's beautiful, isn't it? It's a lovely specimen, and it's got the classical sort of tilia sort of formation where you've got these beautiful sort of arching fan shaped branches. And I would imagine, not having seen this tree in the autumn, that it should go a really nice buttery yellow before it sheds as well. And beautiful with that size, too. Yes. Well, Stephen, Sir Arthur Streeton. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, it's been fabulous to come into this garden mm. and find out a little bit about the history of one of our famous artists here in Australia. Yeah, and his garden to lure his wife out of Turak, which failed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, just, I just love the whole concept of it all. Yes, yes. Well, if you want to know where and what we're doing next week, you'll have to hit subscribe. Yes, so join us again next week. Uh, and don't forget we do our Monday shorts. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a question you'd like to ask me, pop it in the uh, comments section below and we will get around to answering your particular question at some point. We will indeed. But until then, we look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Bye all.